the people sing, singing the song of angry men. It is the music of a people who will not be slaves again. When the beating of your heart echoes the beating of the drums, there is a life about to start when tomorrow comes. Will you join in our crusade? Who will be strong and stand with me? Beyond the barricade, is there a world you long to see? Then join in the fight that will give you the right to be free. Do you hear the people sing, singing the song of angry men? It is the music of a people who will not be slaves again. When the beating of your heart echoes the beating of the drums, there is a life about to start with you. Some will fall and some will live Will you stand up and take your chance? The blood of the martyrs will water the meadows of France Do you hear the people sing? Singing the song of angry men This is the music of the people who will not be slaves again When the beating of your heart echoes the beating of the drums There is a light about to start with tomorrow This evening will be a conversational interview. Kevin Sessoms will draw upon Larry Kramer's experience, his hope, and his strength. We will learn at the feet of people who were a part of history how HIV and AIDS has impacted the world at large and particularly the LGBTQ community. Kevin is a, is a remarkable writer and interviewer. His interactional skills were fine-tuned by 14 years as a contributing editor to Vanity Fair, as well as executive editor of Interview Magazine. Larry is a magnificent and unconventional man. Every person we talked to in, when we created this, this exhibit told us the same thing. And we talked to at least 15 people, and they all said, you can't tell the story of HIV and AIDS without spotlighting Larry Kramer. A close look at every major event in the, in the history of this pandemic shows Larry at the center of action. He co-founded the, uh, the Gay Men's Health Crisis and founded the extraordinary political action group appropriately named ACT UP. And now on behalf of the World Age Museum and Educational Center, we present an evening with Larry Kramer. Thank you for coming, my goodness. Um, I was gonna do this intro for Larry, but if you're here, you know who he is and how important he is and also what a mensch he, he is. Um, uh, and I, 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 we all think of him as an activist. Some One person out there thinks of him as a husband. Um, uh, I first and foremost think of him as a writer and a great writer. Uh, so I thought, well, I think I'll write him a limerick to introduce him, all right? So this is my limerick for Larry, okay? <laughs> there is a man named of Kramer who is a famous, a fearless sex samer. The fisting he did was not about id. Without his life, our lives would be lamer. That's for you, Larry. <laughs> Although since you speak, you always uh, you know, are about the truth. I don't know if all the fisting you did was just you? not about it. I, I, don't, I don't know that. So, um, so is this your first time in a church in a long time? <laughs> you don't want to know. I, I wanted to say one word about how not, I how knocked out I was when I saw the museum yesterday for the first time. I was overwhelmed with what a magnificent thing you, you've made here. It's the first one in the world. It is so well done. It's got to be put on, on, on top of the list of things for gay people all over the world to come. Amazing. <laughs> Thank you. 
what did you take away from that visit? From the museum? Mm. Uh, a zillion hundred thousand memories. That's right. yeah. um, there's, there's a famous line in The Normal Heart that starts, you've always known there's something wrong. There's something wrong, yeah. That's, that's sort of what you've known. You've always known there's something wrong. It How just seemed just so obvious that something was happening mm -hmm. because it, it hit originally my friends, my age. Mm -hmm. um, on Flower Island, I was a big party boy. Mm -hmm. And uh, my friends died first. And through uh, Dr. Lawrence Mass, who wrote a health column for the New York native, he kept me, he, who was an old friend, kept me apprised of funny things that were happening around the country um, that were cropping up mainly the pneumocystis pneumonia and then the chaos. Mm -hmm. And then lo and behold, there was that article in the New York Times. And I just, I said, I just knew. I had written in faggots about, I thought, that um, we had overdone it somehow. Uh, but that was more in terms of trying to find love. And I sort of, somewhere on Far Island will teach you one thing, is you'll never find love uh, among all that sex. Mm -hmm. But you were sort of vilified when that, when that book came out. You were... Well, that's what they say. Did you, did you feel it? It was funny. It was my first experience of, of being um, dumped on. <clears throat> the book was supposed to come out. The book was published like in September. And that summer, my sister-in-law and I were in Florence. Um, and I was sitting in this beautiful little park in Florence and reading a, a gay newspaper that I happened to pick up that I'd never heard of called Body Politic, which for some reason was for sale in, uh, in Florence. And I opened it, and there's a book review of faggots. And it said, you must tell everyone you know not to read this book or buy this book. <laughs> and who wrote it? And I said, oh my. So, you so that's how it's going to be. And the reviews were not particularly kind. But I got an awful lot of mail from people saying thank you for for telling my life to. Do you think writing faggots was one of your first steps toward activism? I, well, you know, most writers think of themselves as activists of one sort or another. I don't think that's true. Um, I never, ever thought I would be an activist. We used to make fun of the people who marched on Gay Pride Parade. You know, we'd be on Far Island Party and there would be this straggling group mm -hmm. walking down Fifth Avenue and we, that was another group right. somehow. You know, watching this, this film up here, it, it, I remember, I have a distinct memory of marching with you in Washington at one of the big gay marches. And it was a beautiful day, I had on a white shirt and I looked down at one point and there were like brown specks on me. I thought, well, what is that? And you turned to me, I have a vivid memory of it. You turned to me and you said, you smell like shit. And I looked down and I'd felt some sprinkles. Someone from the side had been throwing shit at us and, and protest of the protest. And so in a way that's sort of your role, that's what your role's been in my life. You're the guy who's told me I've smelled like shit. I mean, you know, you've, you've like, you've like, you know, straightened up, you know, you're smelling like shit. Well, let's, let's talk about your new book, all right? Uh, the, yeah, The American People, right. Only part one. Mm, it's only part one. Mm -hmm. And it's 800 pages. It's hard to hold in bed. Paperback's easier. <laughs> I guess somewhere along the line of, of, um, of so many people dying, 
and being surrounded by it all the time. I, uh, I wanted to find out more about where HIV came from and what, what about it, its history, which hadn't been written. And the more I re read into everything, took me further and further back into our history until I realized that we have been here since the beginning of America, since Jamestown, which was an all-male colony. Um, and then I began to realize as I further read into the history of this country how nothing about homosexuality is ever in any history book about the gay people who were famous. Um, and the more I read, the more I realized how many of them were famous, famous presidents. Um, Gore Vidal had told me about Lincoln and about, and about Hamilton um, and George Washington. And, um, but no one was, you know, people would laugh when you told them that. So it's, you realize that most history books are written by straight people and they wouldn't know what gay people, what a gay reader would, would know. When I read Mark Twain's life, I mean, the man was so obviously gay. All his friends were gay. He ran off and left his wife to go with a man around the seven seas. What's all that about? <laughs> and um, so somewhere along the line, I started writing and writing and became the history of my history of the American people. Um, the first volume goes up to um, 1950s with the McCarthy stuff in volume two, which um, I'm in the middle of now is gonna be about the plague, the plague of AIDS. <clears throat> so thank God I'm still alive. I'm, I think I'm a, one of the few people who was on the front line from the beginning, who still is alive. I knew who all the people are. I know all the cast of characters. <clears throat> I know who the enemy was. I know who the evil ones were. I know who the shits were. I know who our friends were, very few. And I decided, okay, I'm gonna fight back and tell that story like it's never been told before. I mean, do you use the real names of these people? Do you name names? Oh, some I do, some I don't. Why do you name some people and then you decide to make up names for other people? I'm just curious as a, as a writer. Well, um, let's just say you know, there are different kinds of historical novels. Some uh, are writing about, obviously, other people under fictional names. Mm -hmm. um, it's like um, there's a Sinclair Lewis novel called It Can't Happen Here, which is getting a lot of uh, attention now because it, uh, he wrote it in the late 30s. It's about fascism. Hmm? It's about fascism. It's about fascism happening in America. And uh, you know who all those people are, even though he uses other names. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of it had to do, it has sometimes to do with people still alive that you um, uh, don't want to take to court. But um, you get the gist of it. I mean, <clears throat> um, there's an awful lot of, e a lot of evil, a lot of evil inherent in this plague in how we have been treated since the very beginning of America, certainly in terms of, of HIV. 
I have, after all this time, I have no doubt whatsoever that AIDS was allowed to happen intentionally. No doubt in my mind when I see and have read everything about what we weren't told and what people didn't do and what politicians like the Donald Trumps of this world come in and make sure that the population doesn't do. Uh, Ronald Reagan is, is the, was the same as Donald Trump. He just smiled better. <laughs> well, you know, when, when people tell me that, you know, you know we, we got through Reagan, we'll get through Trump, you know, a lot of us didn't get through Reagan. Our friends died during those, those years. That always angers me that we didn't get, we didn't get through, through those years. Some of us were lucky enough and did, but thousands of our friends didn't. Um, that always angers me, but I'll just drop that into the conversation. But, so what, what do you think of the Trump? years, I mean, that are upon us. You've brought up his name, you've invoked his name. It's, it's pretty hard not to be very depressed. Um, that t-shirt that I held up is sort of like, oh no, I've got to fight this fight again. Um, what, what did it say for those who couldn't read it in, in mm -hmm. the back? What did the t-shirt say for those who couldn't read it in the back? You couldn't? Oh. It's just this, you know, I gotta fight this fucking shit all over again. <laughs> I, am, I am really very, very frightened about what is going to happen to us as, as gay people. I have, I, I am terrified what's going to happen. And I pray that we have learned from, from the activism that was so successful uh, with ACT UP and, and getting the AIDS drugs that we as a population can be visible and, and, and obnoxious and very angry and fight back because there will be a lot of things to fight against. They're already starting to chip away at, at, at gay marriage. And it's, it's gonna be like Roe v. Wade. They're gonna chip away, chip away at it until it's um, a shadow of its former self. Um, I know that the research on HIV, no matter what they say, is still at the mercy of the most evil, greedy pharmaceutical companies um, who have no incentive really to develop a cure because they're able to sell the medicines that they do have at such an exorbitant fee. Why do you want to cure it? Anyway, too many people want us dead and we have never, as a population, faced up to the fact that people don't just dislike us, they hate us. They hate us. And when they are in power, as many of them most often are, we have to fight back. We have to find a way for all of us to fight back in whatever way we can. Um, this is a relatively affluent community and, and probably you're all old farts like me. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you've got to make your voices heard and your faces seen at every opportunity. That Women's March on Washington was enormously impressive. That was the largest demonstration that has ever been held in this country. And we, are we able to mount the same sort of thing ourselves? Would you all travel to Washington to march in a parade? It's more than parades, though. I mean, we all know 
someone who has someone's ear, who has someone else's ear, let them know that what they're doing is unacceptable. If you have politicians, elected officials, who are not helping us, you know, go stand outside their homes, picket their homes. Very effective. They don't like that. <laughs> it is effective. I truly believe the more obnoxious you can be, the better. I learned long ago you do not get more with honey than with vinegar. And we've been, in terms of fighting, for most of our history, we've not been very good fighters. Uh, we're wonderful other things, but we've been not good fighters. And that's, I think, the, the saddest message that I've learned over the last years, that we're such a wonderful people. Why aren't we all fighting to demand our rights, what we're entitled to? I am, but, you know, there were shock troops. There were, you know, I would say 2,000, 3,000 3, maybe at the most um, the, during those ACT UP years. We were warriors. We, we did fight. We did make a difference. Anthony Fauci said, you know, medicine, there's before Larry and, af and after Larry. Uh, we got the drugs in our bodies. I'm, there was a moment, you're, you were famous for the speech uh, when you were founding ACT UP, when you said, you know, two-thirds of you stand up, you'll be dead in five years. I'm sure if two-thirds of the people stood up here, they're alive now because we did fight and we did get the drugs to, to help these two-thirds uh, be here tonight. Uh, so we, we have it in us to fight. Uh, well, let me just say to that, at the height of the horrors, when there were ACT UP chapters all over the country, there couldn't have been more than about 10 or 15,000 people fighting. Mm -hmm. And if you consider how many gay men there were, that's not very many. But so, they were effective and we were warriors. And, and yes, I'm not, you they know, were, but yes. I'm just saying, we got potential armies. But look at, look at the country. And what percentage of us go out and volunteer to be in the military? I mean, there's always a small percentage of people who are going to be the warriors. And maybe we need it again, you know, at some point, because now we have Trump. But I think it's up to us as old guys who are battle uh, weary, not, 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 not weary, but wise, uh, to mentor these younger people and let them know about what we went through. And I, this thing tomorrow at the AIDS mu Museum that focuses on, on young, young people, I mean, sometimes I'm upset when I go out with young people and I'll mention ACT UP, and they'll ask me what I'm talking about. They won't even know what I'm talking about. And I, get, I used to get angry about it. I used to be angry at them, and now I'm angry at us, because it's up to us as older gay people to mentor these people. We always had mentors coming up, you know, and it's up to us to mentor these, these people. At least that's what I think. You're giving me the side eye. <laughs> okay, go out and mentor. <laughs> I know, that's too goody-goody. Now, one of the, a quote from um, the, the American People Part One is, Throughout history, there is always much reward for the hater. Lands to be seized, d daughters to be stolen, goods to be ransomed, animals to be harnessed. Uh, I, we were talking about this before we came on stage. The importance of hatred, that at some point there are junctures in history where there is a moral imperative to meet hatred you know, that hatred has to be well met. If we're hated, then we can't be too genteel. We can't think we're better than the haters. We have to hate them back, I think. That's just my personal opinion. I just said that. Mm. You know Hannah, who Hannah Arendt was, the great um, philosopher, social thinker? 
of, of, of Nazi from Germany who wrote Eichmann in Jerusalem, one of the greatest thinkers of the 20th century and a personal hero of mine, said the Jews should have had their own army to fight back right away. It's true, we don't have an army, but we, um, for a little while, we had ACT UP. Mm -hmm. The minute the drugs were there, everybody disappeared and went back to their former lives. Um, and that has been very sad for me to see um, that even with the drugs that we have, the uh, Truvada, um, sexually transmitted diseases are way, way, way up. The, the, the figures of, of new infections in all populations are up, but you don't read about that in the paper. It's no longer front page news. People of color are suffering disproportionately. There's a very good book out called uh, How to Survive a Plague by David France, which deals with the history of, of, of ACT UP and how we got the drugs. But it ends on a happy note of, yay, we got the drugs. And I thought it isn't a happy ending. It's a sad ending because the drugs pretty much destroyed activism, what we had. So, um, But if, if, if the reason to be activist, let's say, was to get the drugs into our system to save lives, if you succeed in a big part of what the activism is, do you kill off the activism by succeeding, by getting the drugs to keep you alive? is that if you succeed in your activism, then do you kill off the act activism that also makes you feel alive? And one, one of the things I miss about those days, those dark, awful, awful days, is how alive we all felt because we were fighting for our lives. We, there was a feeling of being, a, there was like, it, the air crackled with it because we were fighting to stay alive. And there is something to be said for that during that time. I miss the camaraderie and the brotherhood and the sisterhood and, and oh, the way women and men came together exactly. within the community. It's the uh, first time that lesbian and gay men worked together in harmony in such an amazing way. And there was such love as we, as we, uh, as we were fighting for our lives and half of us were dying along the way. I mean, that was one, one of the things I think is interesting about what you wrote about in Faggots, about sort of this hedonistic life that we were living. Uh, because let's be honest, there was a certain point for gay men especially that sex was a political act, that we were a political act. So it, it, got, it became a life of, of its own. But then once the plague hit, we became Florence Nightingales almost. We were helping friends. We were by beds. We were cleaning bedpans. We were sticking with our friends and caring for them in ways. And we were proving, I'm not going to cry here, whew, how good we were as a people. How good we were. How basically good we were. And how we were saving each other. So there was this weird dichotomy that was almost dizzying in a way because it changed like that. It was like, we have to grow up. We're not Peter Pans, you know. We're we have to grow up and care for each other because no one else was caring for us. So the plague proved our goodness. We had to go through this crucible to prove to the world how good we were, and maybe to ourselves, maybe. I, I don't know. But one of the things that I read was because I think the normal heart is a truly great play, truly great. It's not just agitprop. <laughs> Um, 
I, I've, I've told you I think it belongs in the canon with Death of a Salesman and Streetcar Names Desire. I think it will be taught for generations. I think it's a great, great play. But I read, I think I read this correctly, that you were inspired to write it after visiting Dachau? Hmm? Is, you were inspired to write that play after visiting Dachau. Is that true? Oh, I, I was kicked out of GMHC right. because I was too loud and obnoxious. And I wanted them to do what ACT UP eventually did. But mm -hmm. it was too early in time mm -hmm. to get people to think that way. And I took it. I took it. I went to London, and then I don't know. One day I decided I would go to Germany, and I looked mm -hmm. at Dachau, and I saw that um, it was opened in I don't know 1933 or some mm -hmm. much earlier year than we thought. And I said to myself, "Holy shit! This thing's been around for a long time, and I didn't know about." It. And that's what I found out about HIV, the more I got into it, that it has been, literally, that virus can be traced back eons, eons, and it was first surfaced in Western Africa in the early 1900s. Well, we didn't know any of that. and. And, and women and men were getting sick, and we weren't told that either. The World Health Organization, um, for some reason, never bothered to tell us. Um, if we had known that women were getting it in Africa in the 20s and 30s, then the New York Times headline could not have said rare disease found in gay men and, and HIV has been entirely known as, as a gay thing, which is what made it so hard to get anyone to pay any attention to it. When in fact it wasn't just a gay thing. And a lot of people knew that, including people at the NIH. Um, what's that all about? What person in power is keeping that knowledge from getting to the people? I think I know some. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but you'll read volume two. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you think, um, I think I read, this was from Frank Rich, who, who said that uh, your Jewishness was part of your gay activism, that, that the Jewish history. Tony, I think. Uh, it was Tony Kushner, right. Yeah. I mean, was he right? Uh, was, he on, was he on to something there? I don't know. He's a good Jew. I've never been a good Jew. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the poll quote of the evening. <laughs> Who knows? Um, I don't know how many people know that you were nominated for an Oscar. I mean, do people know that? Yeah, yeah. He was nominated for Women in Love. He had a whole movie career before he was an activist. Uh, well, he, he, he wrote the screenplay for Women in Love. That was what- Women in Love has a famous new right, wrestling scene. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you were nominated for it, but you lost to the guy who wrote MASH, Ring Lardner Jr. Huh? You lost to the guy who wrote MASH, yeah, yeah. Ring Lardner Jr. Well, uh, he had been blacklisted. So. Yeah, he, yeah, exactly. He, he had been blacklisted, and his brother was an anti-fascist. They were both anti-fascist during the Spanish uh, Civil, Civil War, War, part of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. Oh, yeah. So it all comes back to um, the American people, part one. Okay? <laughs> Go out and buy that book. Um, oh, you had touched, let's get back to HIV AIDS. Uh, you had touched earlier uh, on PrEP. You, you mentioned true VADA as a drug, and you, you sort of took a controversial uh, position at one point uh, against PrEP. You were, I mean, pe people called you a condom Nazi, uh, that, that, you know, that you were 
back to your old ways of saying, you know, don't fuck, don't fuck, don't fuck. So what is your attitude now about PrEP? I never said don't fuck. I said cool it. <laughs> In the first scene of The Normal Heart, the doctor says to, uh, to, the, to Ned Week's character, uh, tell me <laughs> to stop having sex. And everybody laughs. Mm. But that's what had happened in 1981, and it didn't. And I don't think I ever came right out and said, don't fuck, but I certainly did say, cool it. And the big problem of the early years of AIDS, before the virus was discovered in 85, was that guys didn't want to believe that anything was transmissible, or they didn't know what the cause was, so don't tell me, you know, don't be so righteous, and don't mm -hmm. tell me to, to cool it, or, or to stop fucking, or whatever. And that was, those were tough years. I got a lot of hate mail. The whole gay political platform then was, you know, that we should be allowed to fuck wherever we wanted and do whatever we wanted. And while that's certainly desirable, there are responsibilities entailed in that, like health care and, mm -hmm. and the person you're, you're having sex with. And it's still a problem that and the, when Truvada came along, I, I was afraid that everybody would just use it as an excuse to go back and stop or stop using condoms and go back and 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 fuck because you can have this drug and take it the next day. And so it's a complicated drug and it's never been presented in that way. It's presented as some sort of of um, pill you take, it'll take care of you, but it's chemotherapy, and it costs a lot of money. And as with any kind of potent drug, you have to have your blood tested quite often to see if it's working. So they don't tell you that in the beginning. Um, well, I, I live in San Francisco now, and mm -hmm. it's weird if you don't take PrEP. I mean, that whole town, if the gay part of that town is on prep, it seems. I mean, it's just sort of the accepted, it's like peer pressure to be on prep. Um, well, better that than that. Right. Like, yeah. we, and it took a while till all the figures came in and we saw the results that were satisfactory. Mm -hmm. um, initially, I just, I'm always cautious about anything, especially coming out of the NIH or the FDA. Anyway, it's here and, and it's very helpful. Mm -hmm. When I started the Aliens Health Crisis in my living room, there were 45, 50, 60 cases, I don't know. And there are now hundreds of millions of cases around the world. And that's pretty scary right. when I think of that. If we had just, if the people had just done what they should have done, as Dr. Matil Krim said, it could have been prevented. And it's because the Donald Trump of the moment, Ronald Reagan, and his, and his hateful wife, Nancy, saw to it that no attention was paid to this on any level. The NIH, which is given zillions of dollars every year to look after the health of all of us, before Tony Fauci ever did anything, it was 19, it was three or four years in. By then, and Dr. Lauenstein the woman who the 
Dr. Noel Hart Space Sun said, you'd probably all be infected by then. Mm -hmm. It was very hard to make people think in those kind of terms. All right. But, you know, I, I converted late in life because I was a drug addict before I got sober. And, uh, you know, I would like to acknowledge tonight, um, you know, I think I'm alive because of people like you. Mm -hmm. I think I'm alive because of people like you. So you can... <laughs> no, it's true. So, you know, I know that you're, sometimes you think your role in life is to be the person who is not optimistic and who, who you know, it's like, it's not good out there, we have to keep fighting, we have to keep fighting, but then there's someone like me who has to acknowledge that you did good, Larry, <laughs> and, um, and a lot of us are grateful and we're thankful, all right? Um, <laughs> So I know I know people say that to me, and I find it. Um, I mean, it's, it's you know it's better than shit being thrown at you. But I've said this before. I don't think I've done anything than any of us. Any of us is not capable of doing. I was educated, I was intelligent. There was a problem, what do we do about it? And that's not rocket science. So I was, I was a writer, so if no one was gonna write about it, I could write about it. And I wrote about it, but no one else was writing, saying the same thing. And I guess people would come up to me and say, thank you for what you're doing. This is early on. And I'd say, I literally I remember saying to some guy, go fuck yourself, why aren't you doing it too? <laughs> <laughs> So maybe that's the Jewish part of me. I mean, <laughs> there's that, you know, it's, it's always room for improvement. There's always something else that has to be done. I do not understand why every single one of us who is gay is not so happy, is not fighting for their lives. I love being gay and I love my gay brothers and sisters. And if anything, that's what's motivated me. Why aren't you all fighting in every possible way for your freedom, for your life, for your rights? Why should straight people have it all? We're the same. And we're being put to the test now. We're going to be put to the test. You wait and see. It gets worse every day. It just gets worse every day. Where do you think our leaders will will come from? I mean, there's a there's a great leader that w we saw earlier, Jeannie Apuzzo, who's who's in. Jeannie Apuzzo. Hey, she's 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 in the crowd. Jeannie Apuzzo, who is. She's the greatest. I, well, we, I've said it to her. She's the greatest leader we ever had. Very early on, in the beginning of National Gay and Lesbian Task Force, she was its first director. And in those days, she didn't give no one paid you a salary. And she had to sleep on beds all over the country. <laughs> she got tired of, sleep, tired of sleeping on, on guest bedrooms with, a, with, a, with somebody's cat. <laughs> Um, and she was a real fighter. She had one gift that I, I admire so much is that 
people would say the most awful things to her and she could just throw it back at them in such an elegant way without showing any anger, but... <laughs> <laughs> she was the good cop and you were the bad cop? Huh? Was she the good cop and you were the bad cop? Was she what? The good cop and you were the bad cop. No, she's a bad cop too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just setting you up tonight. <laughs> You almost died a few years ago. I mean, you are a survivor. I, I, when I, I mean, I visited you several times in the hospital, and I, I thought I wouldn't see you again. And um, sorry, um, and yet you survived. Mm -hmm. And let, yet you survived. I mean, you're here tonight. You're sitting on this stage. I mean, it's just you're you're a miracle to me that you are here now. So is it, the, is it the American People Part Two that is keeping you alive? Is it David? Is it just your orneriness? I mean, what keeps you alive? You are remarkable. You're a miracle. Well, certainly it's got a lot to do with David yeah. and, and, and finishing the American People. But it's David who kept me alive. Um, with all the doctors I knew who were taking care of me and and I was getting worse and worse he just marched in and got to the bottom of everything and mm -hmm. got rid of the, the doctors and found me the new doctors who did save my life and uh, he's done that a couple of times can't ask for more from a husband than that. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I, there gotta be a bore to live with. You get to a certain age, you can't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> Such a drag. <laughs> so it all comes back to love. I mean, it all comes back to love. I mean, that's what you write about a lot. You write about the obstacles to love the complications of love, finding love, the permutations of love, family love, man-on-man -man love, uh, community love. Um, you, I think your activism has been an act of love. I really do. I think you love gay people. And I think your activism has been about loving being gay. I, th I think it was a real journey for you from discovery to guilt to acceptance. Uh, I mean, I think your being gay is a truly a sacred part of you. I mean, you do treasure it, and you don't understand why other people don't treasure their own gayness and just think, well, that's just, you know, that's just this little, little part of me. It's a very integral part of who you are as a man. One of the uh, things that your Women in Love did was it won Glenda Jackson, an Best Actress, Oscar, uh, you wrote her a part that won her Best Actress. She was just in King Lear. You're sort of in the King Lear phase of your life. <laughs> uh, you've always, you know, roared like Lear. Uh, so there's there's a quote in Lear: uh, "Love and be silent." Uh, I think tonight we all love you, Larry. I know I do personally, uh, and we never want you to be silent. Never, okay? <laughs> Doing my best. <laughs> it's not, what did they say about it? Getting old is not for sissies. <laughs> I'm sure you all understand that. Um, well, you know, David makes sure I write every day. And uh, he's uh, a good inspiration and a, and a good slave driver. <laughs> well, thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, and thank, thank you, Larry Kramer, for being on my life.